All right, so we're going to be talking uh, beyond the basics here. It's about 9.01. We're going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to be talking about building security into your development projects. So about me, I'm Logan Kipp. I am the lead security analyst at SiteLock, website security company. We do uh, an assortment of different things. We have a booth set up. You'll be able to visit and learn more about that as we go throughout the conference. We've got three general subjects I'm going to cover, and then uh, I'm going to pass the microphone on over to my colleague, Vinod. He'll introduce himself. So first things first, malware. Who here has had a website under their control hacked? Hey, there we go. There we go. You know how it goes. You know, uh, I actually thought that uh, not so many people would be willing to raise their hands because uh, I know it's a little embarrassing, like, uh, you know, having some medical condition you don't want anyone to know about. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, information has been uh, spreading like wildfire. People are becoming more aware. Um, and uh, people are becoming more informed about how to identify malware symptoms. So. As you've probably seen throughout uh, the wide, wide internet, there are a lot of different uh, defacements that come about. And those are easy to spot, obviously, through their nice bragging pages. Some of them are quite spooky, actually. Hooded figures, skeletons, folks uh, <coughs> putting masking tape over faces. Scary, right? But I think the scariest malware is the stuff that you don't necessarily see right away. A spooky skeleton. Found this little uh, Easter egg here a couple months ago. We'll call him Fred. Fred's dead. And then, of course, there's the pharma hacks. Now, the great thing about these is uh, they are also easy to spot, uh, usually uh, motivated by monetary gain. Uh, redirection, uh, implementation of uh, poisoned search engine results with the goal of redirecting traffic, most likely to uh, gain revenue. Um, also directing to rogue pharmacies, which of course are a big cash cow for the underground. And then we've got the stuff that doesn't like to show itself. So the impact's about the same. With defacements, when I talk to customers, or clients rather, uh, that have been hacked, they've got defacements, it's usually a pretty quick fix, right? But when we've got something that's hiding, doesn't want to be found, it becomes a little trickier. How do you find it? Well, we've got uh, some suggestions later on, but um, obviously this guy we could pick up through uh, looking for obfuscation. This appears to be Base64. Who's seen Base64 pop up on their site? Yeah. Kind of nasty, but not too hard to detect with uh, you know, current malware detection technologies. You can kind of look for that. And there's these guys, dictionary-based. Now, those are a little bit trickier to pick up, right? Doesn't look all that strange. Um, we've got words like Kathleen, Brandon. These are people's names. These are words from dictionaries. You really have to be kind of smart when it comes to uh, detecting these guys. So, for example, we found this. Um, we do malware remediation. Uh, we found this one through file change monitoring. So, one thing you could do to implement, uh, or one thing you could implement is, of course, file change monitoring. Shows that uh, these little guys have popped up. They don't belong. But I'm going to show you a couple real-world examples. The first of which is a, an example of cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is a type of secu uh, computer security vulnerability typically found in web applications. Cross-site scripting, or XSS, enables attackers to inject client-side scripts into websites viewed by other users. I won't go too in-depth due to the time restraints here, but uh, there's a few different kinds there that uh, we can talk about a little more um, if you catch me at the booth. So I'm going to go through an example here that uh, was picked up by our research team. A uh, gentleman named Weston Henry has picked up through a routine scan a potential cross-site scripting vulnerability. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but uh, in this red box here, we've got a variable set called cur. I assume that means current. Um, it's referencing some settings. This is taken from a plugin we've kind of uh, 
removed any references to the plugin because the goal of this isn't to uh, call anyone out, of course. Um, in this case, uh, Weston did contact the plugin developer and uh, this has been patched, so it's safe at this time. So we looked at settings.php, the argument current. Looks like it's just echoing straight variable contents without any type of filtering. All right, well, what's, what's behind current or cur? So we found cur at uh, lines 195 and 90, 196. The, uh, it's set to default if CNTR is empty or if the value of CNTR is not, or, or the value of CNTR if, uh, if it is set, which is uh, set at lines 91 and 92. We can see it's actually passing in the value of a get variable, which is kind of dangerous if you're not doing any kind of filtering. So if get s counter is set, it inherits the value. So this is the kind of thing we're looking for when we're looking for a cross-site scripting vulnerability. This is an outside bit of data that's being passed into the system. That's kind of dangerous. Well, could this be a reflective cross-site scripting vulnerability? Let's find out. So if we actually set the value of that, to uh, just some proof of concept. What we generally use is a nice little uh, uh, document cookie alert that's most visually pleasing and it's harmless. Um, this is session based, so this will impact only you and not anyone else that's currently on the website. So, for example, if I pass in the following string here, the uh, page slider settings as counter script alert, what we should expect to see is a pop-up little pop-up screen if this is in fact vulnerable. Well, let's see what happens. Sure enough. So this is a, uh, this was a slider, and this isn't the slider you think it is. This is actually post soak soak. So this is something that's new. This is something that's still happening. Folks just accidentally integrate these things into their plugins, and which in turn are downloaded. This is a top 1000 plugin, so it was rather uh, important that we found it. One thing you can do to uh, block these as well, in case you do accidentally introduce this into the environment, is utilize a web application firewall. Those are real-time um, monitoring systems that are actually looking at the data that's being passed to your server. So a modern web application firewall, such as this one we're using here, is able to block this. And you can use that data to uh, figure out how people are targeting your website. So not only is it, is it a good uh, defense mechanism, it also helps you with your research on how to better secure your website by learning how folks are targeting you. <clears throat> Second example here is one uh, presented by another one of our researchers, Mr. Gregory Bloom. Um, we're going to call this Tango. Um, again, we, we, we're not calling anyone out, so uh, we just want to uh, educate folks. This is a really cool plugin, one that I loved using. Um, it allows you to view and edit files on your server, zip and unzip. You could manage your database. A lot of cool features if you're not too uh, adept at doing these things yourself. Looks something like this when you're using it. Nice little file monitoring or file management screen. Down at the bottom, there's some more options. Database backup and restore. Way cool. This particular plugin. Uh, is it does require authentication. If you're not logged into WP Admin, well then you're not going to get access to it. You get this little screen. Good. The plugin consists of four files. Error log, file manager, index, and readme. I decided to open this up here. Well, that's curious. If y'all can see here, the authentication along with everything else relies on a very early if statement. If file exists, readme.txt. So it's not actually doing a whole lot if that file's not there, right? So what happens if we, say, rename that file? Let's call it readme1.txt. We get access. Now one of the options down at the bottom there is actually shell access. So when we get access to this plugin by accidentally renaming README. Who here removes README files when they upload a plugin? Yeah, we've got a few people. I do. I don't like them there. 
I don't need to read it, I've already read it. So I go and I remove README because I don't want it cluttering up my file system or file structure. And I have accidentally given someone backdoor access. Well, just what can we do? Like I said, this does give shell access. I can pop open the wp-config. I have access to the database there directly. Hopefully they've got remote management set up. <laughs> I can ls root and take a look. I could even um, cat etsy password. I can get uh, all their usernames, though the passwords are going to be hashed. But you can do a lot of fun stuff there too. We can grab external files to deliver a malware payload, a command control module. We can make this a, a botnet master. We could dump the entire file structure. Or, if anyone knows what this little string at the bottom is, we can certainly trash the entire system. So this uh, writes random data to your SDA. That's bad, if you weren't aware. <laughs> so that'll, that'll go ahead and cause you a bad day. So that's a Tango plugin. And here's our friend. He's never going to give you up. <laughs> so the, uh, the moral of the story is it's very easy to uh, accidentally integrate some very problematic security flaws into your environment. So uh, my colleague's going to be talking a little bit about uh, how to integrate security into your development life cycle in order to assure that you're not doing this. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. So, Logan's um, explained what malware looks like, what vulnerabilities look like. Um, why should you care about having malware? Simply because it leads to a loss of reputation or loss of revenue, often both. There's no upside to having malware, none. So how does malware get up there? Does Logan showed you that there are vulnerabilities that exist in code, and that could be a way that people put malware on your side. So it's simple. If I don't have any vulnerabilities in my code, no malware gets on there. Or I reduce the incidence of malware on my site. So it could be a technical problem. It could just be I just need to make sure that all my code is bulletproof, and that would solve the problem. Unfortunately, that's not what we found. We found that the reason you have vulnerabilities in your code, the main reason you have vulnerabilities in your code is complexity. Okay? Um, anybody here with children? I have a two-year-old. So when we brought her home, we said, man, my life just got a whole lot more complex, right? And she started crawling. More complexity. She started walking and reaching up to stuff. More complexity. Now she talks. Right? Even more complex. So complexity is inherent in anything to do with human endeavor. And over time, that complexity builds. It gets, things, get just, things just get more and more and more complex. Right? So you start off with a simple HTML page. All you have is a little bit of HTML talking about your restaurant business. Okay? Over time, you're going to find that you need more. You need an ordering system. You've decided that you're going to get cupcakes from here to 50 miles from here within 20 minutes. Right? And you start adding to your website. You use a framework, you use themes, components, plugins, etc. What's that done to your code base? You've got a huge number of files now in your code base that's running your website. Right? Have you checked all the code to see if there are any vulnerabilities in there? Is it possible? Maybe you could. Maybe for version one of your website, you spend two weeks checking out all the vulnerabilities in code. And you're convinced that there's no vulnerability here. Nobody can SQL inject you. Nobody can use cross-site scripting. Nobody can use any of the other OWASP top 10 things. You're pretty happy. Two weeks later, there's a new release. Six weeks later, there's a new release. Eight weeks later, there's yet another release of the same plugin. How often are you going to go back and check that code? It becomes difficult to do that because you're also trying to get a cupcake 50 miles from here within 20 minutes. Right? There are people here who are um, um, freelance consultants. Yeah. So what happens when 
your client who actually owns that bakery calls you and says, my website's hacked. How long does it take you to find the problem? So let's say it takes you two hours to fix the problem. Where do you spend an hour and 45 minutes? Finding the problem. Right? Once you find the problem, the solution is pretty trivial, but you spend most of your time trying to find the problem. That's where the issue is. Right? So what can we do about that? We know that complexity is going to grow, and we know that the more complex code is, um, the more likely you are to find vulnerabilities in it, the more likely that malware is going to end up on it. The other thing that makes things more complicated is that attackers are increasing the complexity of their attack. So things that were secure until last month may not be secure next month. What are you going to do about that? How would you find a way to keep checking on the vulnerability of your code or to keep protecting your code in the face of escalating complexity on the hacker side? One thing you could do is use a web application firewall. So Logan touched on a web application firewall. That's sitting between the internet and your website. It's observing the behavior of visits to your website. And it's smart enough to understand that this visit is from a hacker or this visit has a malicious intent and it blocks that request, right? So it's one thing you could do. The other thing you could do is write slightly more secure code and check how secure your code is on a periodic basis. So to demonstrate this, we actually wrote a plugin. We called it My Plugin, right? And we deliberately left a vulnerability in the code. Um, I don't know if that displays uh, sharp enough for you to see this. Can you see where we haven't escaped or sanitized that input? So as Logan pointed out earlier, there's a chance for cross-site scripting there. Um, and we uploaded that code into one of our tools. So we have something called a static code analyzer. Um, what it does is it takes a look at all your source code and figures out, is there any vulnerability in here? Can I SQL inject this code? Okay, this is white box testing. So we take our code, pass it through this tool. It gives us output saying, you've got a problem here, 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 and here. And then it's a lot easier to fix it. So that two-hour problem now becomes an, a 15-minute problem. Because the tool's going to tell me where the problem is. And then I just need to fix it. So we ran it through that um, analysis. And our uh, tool told us that we've got a couple problems. One is cross-site scripting. One is SQL injection. And then we went deeper into it. And we found the exact line of code where the problem starts. So down below there, what you're seeing is a call stack. Right? On the left are the files in your project. Down below is the call stack. When you click on a file in the call stack, it highlights a line where the vulnerability was either introduced or you know, it keeps passing through the, the problem. So we found the issue. And then we fixed it. WordPress has a number of really good sanitizing functions. So escape HTML is one of those things that you would use. So we use that function from within WordPress. We remove the vulnerability. And then we ran the tool again. There are a number of security-related sanitizing functions within WordPress. You should always use them. Here's about three of those. If you go to the WordPress site, you'll see a bunch more. So escape HTML, sanitize text field, update option, these are good WordPress functions to use. After we used that, we ran that scan again. And this time, we, said we found that we'd come out with 100. So we're secure. We're fine with this code. The point of the story is that it's hard for human beings to go through tens of thousands of lines of code to find vulnerabilities. But it's pretty trivial for software to do that. Right? What you get out of this? is software that's consistently finding the problems in your code before it gets pushed. It may not be your code. It could be code that you, know, you inherited or you got because you're using a plugin or a theme or something. Which brings us to the SDLC part of it. <clears throat> Everybody uses some software development lifecycle. Right? You don't have to be a Fortune 500 company to have one. It could be as simple as this. I'm going to write code. I'm going to test. Did I find any bugs? Yes, I'm going to write more code. I'm going to test again. And then I'm going to publish. 
There's another version of this SDLC, which is just, I'm going to write code and I'm going to publish, but we'll skip that one. This, we call this the insecure SDLC, because all you've done here is you've, you've tested for functionality. Does it do what I intended my site to do? Okay. When you introduce security into this SDLC, you just add one little gray box. I don't know if it's popping enough on that screen, but you see that box on the lower right hand, um, in the lower right-hand corner? You're writing code, you're testing. Assuming you don't find any bugs, you review your code for vulnerabilities. And we highly recommend you automate that process. So our tool is called TrueCode, and there are a number of tools out there. It doesn't matter so much whose tool you use as that you use a tool. That's going to save you a lot of time, and it's going to save you a lot of hard burn. Did you find any vulnerabilities? If you did, go back, write more code, go through your test cycle, again, review for vulnerabilities. If you didn't find any, then you go into your pen testing stage. This is another thing we do with our software. Before we make a big push to production, we involve a third party. It's, um, it's not that we don't have folks in our group who can do the penetration testing, but it's usually better to involve somebody other than the developer when you do pen testing. There are people who do it you know, full time, professionally, they do it for a living. Get somebody to pen test your code. Even if you don't do the pen testing, at least do the code review for vulnerabilities, right? Once all that turns out clean, you publish. <coughs> Once you take these two steps, your insecure SDLC now becomes a secure SDLC. Any questions? Pen oh, penetration testing. So what happens is, in the case of our uh, static code analyzer, that's white box testing. So we are giving this piece of software, all our source code, and saying, you analyze this and tell us where the problems could be. A penetration test is black box, te is black box testing, where you say, you're a person who understands how to break security. You're a person who understands how to get into websites. You could be a hacker if you wanted to, but you've chosen not to be. So that person kind of hacks your website. You know, they'll get a get out of jail you know, free card from you, and then go hack your site. And they tell you, these are the ways I was able to get in. Uh, ours is called True Code. True Code? Yeah. Is that available publicly? Yeah. Yeah. Stop by our booth. We've got a bunch of people who can tell you all about it and, and, and get you set up. Okay. Yes, we dog food. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You can do multiple files. You can just tell, you just tell us where your doc root is, and then we'll give us FTP credentials, and we'll pull down your entire doc root, and then we examine as as a project. So you know, we take the PHP, we put it through a compilation process, we examine it as a project, and we tell you, okay, here are all the vulnerabilities that you have in your code. It's mainly based on complexity. So we're finding things get more and more complex. So eight years ago when we first started out, the malware that we found was pretty simple. Now the attacks are getting much more sophisticated. As Logan mentioned, um, you know, and Logan, jump in whenever you want. As Logan mentioned, like, you know, there are more and more things that people will put on your website that they don't want you to see. Absolutely. So, I mean, in some of the slides here you saw where I referenced basic before code, simple obfuscation used, used to work to uh, conceal the identity of the malware. Well, that's not really going to cut it anymore when we have automated systems like, for example, SiteLock's smart system just picks it right up. So they go a little bit more complex. Uh, this is these dictionary-based named variables, that, that's pretty tricky to pick up. Well, thank goodness we're also taking a look at uh, file changes. Uh, thank goodness we're notifying someone that, hey, this changed. That's a core file. Should you really be, should that have changed? Uh, the trends we're seeing right now are that, uh, strangely enough, folks seem to be targeting sliders. <laughs> um, though that's just the weekly trend. It does change week by week. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. Um, around the holidays, it usually, you usually see a pretty big uptick in uh, pharmacy-based hacks, which are usually the more complex hacks because they usually have more funding and therefore usually better programmers. 
This last season wasn't such an uptick, though, luckily. Yes, sir. Um, so you, you guys keep mentioning complexity, which I'm assuming is sufficient but not necessary. I, I guess, so my question is, even if you have a simple code base, How simple is your code base? How many lines of code do you have? How many files do you use? Could be a few thousand lines of code. Did you write them all yourself? Yeah. Oh, then it's likely that you have less complexity in your code. But it'll tend to grow. And even if your code is not that complex, um, in our example plugin, for example, right? Um, it, in our sample plugin, it wasn't very complex, but we introduced a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And we actually also you know, introduced a SQL injection vulnerability. It was on purpose, but it was there. So it's just, once your code becomes complex, once your code base becomes large, then it's really difficult for you to keep on top of it manually. Um, it depends on the product we're referring to. Um, for static analysis, we support PHP, um, JavaScript, um, some Java. And we see that fairly frequently. Um, yes, yeah, so um, he had asked whether uh, it's possible for the malware to live outside of the www, the uh, doc root, which is sometimes called public HTML as well, um, or even in the MySQL uh, database. Absolutely, we do see that. Obviously, it's not executing um, until it's called by your front end scripts. Uh, but yeah, we do see that, not as frequently as, say, PHP or JavaScript-based malware. Um, but what you can do, uh, that's why it's also important not just to do your file-based testing. Uh, another approach we take is an outside-in approach, um, doing an external malware scan as a crawler. That's going to display the actual uh, results that are being given to a visitor. If the uh, malware wants to have the ability to take action, it needs to be delivered to the end user. So we're going to see it with that, that crawling-based method. Um, if malware were to exist, say, higher up in the directory, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. We do see that. It's not very common. Usually, they're focusing on command and control of the website. But if we do see something uh, higher up, um, well, that's, that's definitely something we'd have to look up on a case. Yeah? Well, it's got to get in somehow, right? So we, we'd like to emphasize it's not just WordPress. It's, it's your website. So there are shell scripts that could exist on your, on your website um, with you know, providing that functionality that Logan was just referring to so that, that somebody could take over your server remotely. But typically, they'll want to put malware somewhere where um, they can leverage it. If it's a part of your directory structure that is just not accessible at all or is not accessed by anything on your operating system at all, there wouldn't be much point. So that's typically why we start at www. Publication, yes? Does that crawler also detect phishing attacks where it puts these files on your server that's not part of your existing files? 
It is, uh, the crawler actually is not what we would typically detect that with. That would usually be our smart module. That is the file-based uh, cleaning and detection system. That is going to find those uh, impersonations. Usually we'll, you can look for you know, top brands and so on. There's, there's actually quite the complex logic behind it. Um, with phishing pages, it's uh, a little trickier. An outside-in scan is not going to be the best approach because we n might not see it by crawling the website. It could be something uh, hidden away deep in some subdirectory. That's why the file-based method is used in tandem. So the best route is, uh, well, we're looking for uh, those names, first of all. If someone's impersonating a major bank, well, it's probably going to pop up, okay, why does Sally's Cupcake website have a login page for Chase Bank? <laughs> you know, that, that's an easy example, right? Uh, but it does become more complex, and, and it's a challenge every time, but that's why we have a full-time research staff, because there is something new every day, and maybe something we didn't pick up yesterday. We're most likely going to pick it up today if we were able to see it and analyze it. What you might consider a false positive? So the question is, um, what if our tool identifies something as a vulnerability, but, or you know, as malware, but it's not? You can whitelist it. You can say that this is not um, a vulnerable piece of code because of this reason. You can identify sanitizing functions that you've written yourself. And we see that, oh, that call is eventually passing through the custom sanitization function, so it's not vulnerable anymore. <laughs> Um, we have a we have a boot set up. Please stop by. We'd we'll be happy to answer those questions. Anything else? Uh, the picture you saw up there was a very simplified version of what we do internally. Um, there are several large models for SDLC. There's Waterfall, which says, wait till the end and then do everything. Um, not very much in favor these days, unless um, you're NASA. Um, there's a more agile methodology. You can do the testing as often as you like. So um, it helps the more often you test. Yes, ma'am. Um, what we do is, like, if you're referring to our product, when we find malware, we actually remove it. If you're getting repeated malware infections in the same place, Logan, you want to take that? Absolutely. We see it a lot. Um, and this will probably have to be our last question. We are out of time. Uh, we do see reinfection a lot. If you haven't put countermeasures in place, you actually are much more likely to be reinfected once infected because you've been, in a, you've been identified as a soft target. So there could be lingering malware, or they could simply be reusing the same door they used before, the existing vulnerability that you haven't found. By integrating this SDLC, for example, with SAST white box testing, um, you would actually have stand a much better chance of identifying the original vulnerability that let them in. So it, we'd have to look at this, this particular case, of course, but most likely they're probably just hopping right back in the same door that they found before.
the permissions. You want to get it out. Yeah, definitely want to Address get that cancer out. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but we are out of time. We'll be at the booth, so if you have more questions, if you want to chat about more about any of the stuff, please stop by. We'll be happy to talk to you. We have t-shirts. Okay.